Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. Well, it's, uh, thank you so much for coming out this evening. I really appreciate it. It's, I was telling Father Dan that I actually wanted to be do giving talks even as far back as my last parish at Joan of St. Joan of Arc, but it just never really worked out. So two and a half years later, I'm finally getting to give my first talk. So this is my make or break, you know. <laughs> if it doesn't work out, I know that, you know, God just spared me for two and a half years, and my pride drove me to this. On the other hand, who knows? It might turn out all right. We might all learn something, huh? So, but once again, thank you so much for coming out this evening. And before we get started, let's begin, as we begin all good things, with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this Advent season as we look forward to the second coming of your Son and prepare our hearts to receive him at his first coming this Christmas season. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit among us to keep our eyes and our hearts ever fixed on what is above, that we may look forward to that day when we are with you in paradise. We ask this and all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Really cheery subjects. <laughs> I'm honestly surprised you came because it's like... It's dark outside, it's cold, and you're like, damnation? Sounds interesting, let's go. Okay. So, uh, you're braver than you look. No, that's good. So, the four last things. Why the four last things? This is a traditional terminology in the church that's developed over a long time. I think the earliest account that we actually see it said this way is by St. Thomas More in his work called The Four Last Things. Um, however... It's pretty straightforward. The last part of our life, we die. After we die, we are judged. And then either we, goodbye. <laughs> All right, and we're back. The devil got into the computer screen. That's what it is. That's why it went blank. No, but we die, and then other t two options. Ultimately, either being received among the elect in heaven or condemned with the reprobate in hell. That's the logical progression. Four things, four possibilities, four last things. Like I said, real cheery, huh? <laughs> How about that, you know? Actually, you know what? Is there a light switch here we can kill for the... Does anybody know which one it is before I hit all of them? Middle? Just the front, I want. Oh, yeah. Can we? Okay, there we go. Great. For the people who will be listening to this later, we just had a thing with lights. Getting back to the program now. Okay. So, the, four, the first of the four last things, death. These are always like, these are, this is a very common painting, actually, a very a style, um, showing like the, um, the brevity of life. So you see, of course, you know, the hourglass empty, the skull, the candle going out, the idea that, you know, the, the dice there, that the die has been cast, um, that there is an end to our mortal life on earth. So, but what exactly is death? We say, oh, death, I know death. Well, do we know death? What is death? We'd say it's the separation of the body and the soul. You see, as human beings, God made us to be body and soul, united. It's not that our souls are our real selves and our bodies are just vehicles we use. No. Your body and your soul go together. This is why I actually like to use the terminology when I explain it to people. You don't have a body. You don't have a soul. You are a body, soul, Union, an enfleshed soul, an embodied soul, an ensouled body. This is what you are. Your body and your soul go together. This is you. This is why, of course, we even show such respect for the remains of the deceased, because we understand that this is the person, and that, we'll 
going to get too far ahead, that there's going to be a resurrection, which will involve that very body. So, okay, death. Now, it's the end of our earthly life, and it's the result of original sin. We know that part of the curse, so to speak, of original sin was that being cut off from God. And God is the one who holds all things in being and keeps them all together. And all of creation, all the cosmos exists in him, and yet they're distinct. There's all of creation and there's God. And bridging that gap is man. Very interestingly, it is man's duty, according to, I believe, Max, St. Maximus the Confessor, Adam was meant to be the priest of creation, so to speak. He has a material existence, just like all things that exist in this material universe. And yet he has a spiritual part of him, too, that makes him like God. He's like one foot in both places. He's unique. And it is man's purpose to, is he's the connection between God and all that exists like this. And so with the original sin, not only are our first parents hurt, but being our first parents, this damage, so to speak, to the human person is passed down to all of us. But because man is at the height of creation, the steward of creation, of God's gift of all that exists, creation is below him. As a result, that original sin wounded not only man and his nature, but all of creation. It's through this original sin that violence and destruction on unprecedented scales entered the world. And part of this is death, the decay of the human body. It's not that God is trying to punish us with death, like, okay, you broke my rules, now I'm going to kill you. No, he's not that petty. He's not petty at all, in fact. It's a matter that it is God who's the author of life, who sustains us, but by rejecting that relationship, we cut ourselves off from that source of life. There's a failing power within us. Our bodies can only sustain so much. So God did not destine us to die from the beginning. We would have been immune from suffering and death if we hadn't sinned in the first place. We would have shared many wonderful gifts. They're called the preternatural gifts. The preternatural gifts were things that weren't necessarily part of man's nature, but were kind of a bonus. For example, immortality, the inability to die, impassibility, the in inability to suffer, knowledge of God. The passions, the emotions, they weren't disordered or thrown out of whack. Everything was well-ordered, balanced. This original sin created a crack that went all the way to our very, the core of our being and causes profound wounds in all of creation. And so as a result, as a consequence of all this, there is now death in the world. But instead of going from life to death, we really see that ultimately we move from death to eternal life. When Jesus Christ, who came to set us free from sin, died on the cross, being not only human, that's how he died, but also God, the source of life, life itself, as he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, what happens? St. John Chrysostom in his Easter homily, his famous Easter homily, it's actually read in the Eastern churches as just the homily for Easter many times, talks about how Death swallowed a bitter pill. Hell consumed the light of heaven. It was own poisonous to it. How when death took in life himself, death was dealt a mortal blow. What's interesting is Jesus Christ did not take away death, or our human experience of natural death. He did something far more dramatic. He made it into the means by which we move to eternal life, and ultimately, even bodily resurrection. He takes what is evil and makes a part of something that's a greater 
good. In baptism, we have already died with Christ spiritually. That's why we say this image of you know, the either being immersed in water or pouring the water. See, in the ancient world, and especially the Hebrew, ancient Hebrew mindset, water was an image that was very strongly connected with chaos, primordial chaos, darkness, evil. And so that's why you see you know, the image of the Israelites going through the Red Sea wasn't just a matter of a miracle. Oh, they went through a, a, the Red Sea. It's more than that. They passed through death through darkness, evil. This is why later on in the, the letters of St. Peter and the other early church fathers, they use that image of the Red Sea as a sign and symbol of baptism. We die with Christ. Water is poured on us. We're immersed in it either way. It's almost like we are entombed in the darkness of the water, but we rise from it. There is a spiritual death that we go through in baptism, and we are reborn new spiritually. And we're called to keep growing in that new spiritual light, life in union with Christ. But while the soul is re, re, uh, you know, re, uh, renewed, the body, not yet. Yes, our bodies are temples. Yes, we must respect our bodies and the bodies of others, of course. But we recognize that we will get a new body but we won't get a new soul. We have one of those to work with. And so it's not that we neglect the body or hate the body, but we acknowledge it as still fallen. We acknowledge it as still imperfect, prone to the sufferings of original sin. We acknowledge that this body will fade. It's not evil, but at the same time, if it comes between a decision to preserve our souls or our bodies, we must put our souls first. Because even then, at the end of the day, that's the very path by which we come to the new body, right? In the resurrection. So Christ changes death. We die spiritually with him and come to new life in grace. But even our own physical deaths become for us no longer the end of our existence, but the beginning of our eternal existence with him in heaven. Few things to clear up. We die once, as it says in the letter to the Hebrews, all men are appointed to die but once. Thus, there is no reincarnation. We do not believe in that. Because once again, your soul is tied to your body. Your body, your soul, they go together, hand and glove. Barbie and Ken, you know? <laughs> Jekyll and Hyde, for some of us, right? But uh, they go together. It's not like, oh, my soul can go into another being. And that's not how that works. This just doesn't work that way. Also, we don't, become, uh, this is, <laughs> we don't become angels. Angels are an entirely different species. Yeah, they're cool, but it's like, that's actually a downgrade, okay? Angels are higher than us in the order of creation, right? Animal, plants, animals, humans, angels, God. But, because of Jesus Christ, who is both human and divine, the one we're baptized into, we're also called to share in the resurrection fully, we, even what we start to now, share in the divine life of God, share his divine nature. The angels don't even get to do that. So the fact that it's like, I want to be an angel, why? You get, get premium, you can get box seats for heaven and you want to go, you know, you want to go to the nosebleed section? I mean... No, it's a, that's not an upgrade for you. It looks like it, but it's a scam. Don't do it. <laughs> okay? So, our ultimate destiny is fixed, though, at the moment of our death. I think this is where a lot of people get hung up, and understandably so. See, death puts an end to our human life as the time that we have to either accept or reject divine grace. Let's see what we have going here. So we come to judgment. So we know that we'll die, but the way we die and what precedes that death does very much to determine our outcome. I think there's uh, something to, this is a section I'd really like to help us try to understand a little bit better. Um, 
There is a quote that I had heard on a show once about how uh, explaining about a person's life, you know, the meaning of somebody's life, and it said that the punctuation mark at the end of a sentence gives meaning to every letter, every space that came before it. Just like the end of a story gives a meaning to the whole thing, right? When we watch or read a tragedy, even if in the middle part there's a lot of good scenes that are really, you know, enlivening and warming and, 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 and heartening, it's a tragedy and that ending is going to paint the way we view even that good part. Conversely, when we read something like a drama, right, they tend to start off well, get bad, and then get better, usually even better. When we get to that middle part of a drama, well, if we know the ending of it, how it's going to be a good ending, we don't mind the bad part as much. The ending defines the whole thing. Just like the punctuation mark at the end of a sentence defines the whole sentence. It's not that God is trying to catch us off guard, like, gotcha. That's why he says to always be vigilant. We don't know when our own end will be. And so we want to try to make it a good ending. That's why you see, for example, St. Dismas, right? St. Dismas, the good thief. You know, Fulton Sheen says he stole heaven, right? The idea that, for all we know, he lived a terrible life before that. I mean, obviously it wasn't going so well if he was not only a thief, but one that was worthy of crucifixion. And yet, what does he do? He confesses and repents. And our Lord says, today you will be with me in paradise. It's never too late to turn to the Lord. But the final decision that we make, it's easier to make it if we've been trying to move in that direction the whole time. We have that momentum already. So when we die, there are two judgments in the church that we understand. There's the particular judgment and the final judgment. But first, the particular judgment when we die. The particular judgment happens at the moment of death. We receive a particular judgment, meaning you in particular. Either the blessedness of heaven, either immediately or after being purified in purgatory, or the alternative of the eternal damnation of hell. I try to explain judgment, which I may have misspelled up there. Stop judging me. <laughs> no, that's fine. You're right. You, you're right to judge me. I'm wrong about that. Well, the computer didn't catch it, so thanks, computer. It really helped me out, pal. <laughs> At any rate, I like to explain diagnose, uh, uh, judgment as diagnosis. If the doctor tells you you have stage four cancer, you don't look at the doctor and say, how dare you? I mean, it's a terrible thing to hear, but it's not like the doctor's doing it to you. He's telling you what he sees. He has a perspective, a, for, a, a, a knowledge to see your current status. He's not saying you're good or bad. He's just saying on a purely you know, diagnostic level, I know what a standard for a healthy human being is, and you don't meet that standard. I have judged, I have determined that you are an unhealthy human being. Think of that. Think of that. Think of also God as a mirror that he shows us the final judge, the particular judgment will be, we will see ourselves as we truly are, both the good and the bad. Because there's a lot of good that's incredible that we, I don't believe we, God lets us see, lest we fall into temptation. But at the same time, there's a lot of bad that perhaps we don't always see either. It's not that God is trying to send somebody to hell He's simply saying, here's your state. You've reached a definition. You've come to the end. You've reached the punctuation mark. Now the sentence that is you has been defined. And it's not a matter of saying, I'm putting you anywhere. It's just simply saying, this is what you are. And at that point, that's when we talk about heaven, hell, and purgatory. Because God does not send anybody anywhere. 
he has never sent anyone to hell or purgatory or heaven, although we never usually say, like, God sent him to heaven. I, okay, great, you know. Uh, because God doesn't have the authority to just do whatever he, it'll come back on. God doesn't, ha, God doesn't have, in a sense, in a sense, he doesn't have the authority to do that because he chooses to respect our free will. We get to choose what we wish to become. We get to define ourselves based off of our choices. God simply respects those choices. And the idea is that we have to be able to see what is my current standing. It's always good. This is why they say we should always do an examination of conscience at night. It's good to go to confession frequently. Even Pope St. Paul VI wrote about the importance of frequent confession, even if there's no mortal sin involved. The idea of being cleansed continually. It's just like... I'll go back to a medical, exp you know, once again, I really, really do believe using medical analogies for this stuff does so much to help and explain it. You know, when they're doing a surgery and someone's bleeding, they spray the water to clear it off so they can see what they're working on. Well, so t that there too, perhaps we have a deeper wound and when we go to confession, we don't have any mortal sins per se, we're just cleaning that off, but it allows us to start going deeper to see, oh, where's the deeper wound? Where's the deeper sinfulness? We don't discover it just so we can put ourselves down, but so we can say, ah, that's where we need to let the divine physician himself come and bring more healing. Frankly, I get excited when I find a new fault of myself. <laughs> because it's like, D that's an opportunity for me to grow. I don't get down. I'm like, wow, I'm particularly selfish in X, Y, or Z. <laughs> that's terrible, but that's great news. Because, you know, you can't, a doctor can't heal you unless you bring your wound or illness to him. Well, you can't bring your illness or wound to him if you don't know you have one. So discovering your faults can be a really good thing. Because you know, like, you know, the more and more I get cleansed, the better and better I'm doing on heading towards the right way. But the particular judgment, it happens once. We go where we have chosen. Heaven is chosen. Hell is chosen. At the end of the day, we actually do get what we want. We do get what we want. And that's a very serious thing. The idea is making sure we want the right thing and knowing that we want it correctly. The final judgment is similar, but not quite the same. The final judgment will happen at the end of the world, the end of all things. And once again, it's not God figuring out, are you guilty or not? It's God saying, you know, the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the weeds. It's not God playing favorites or picking who he wants. You know who he wants saved? All of us. It's simply he recognizes where we have chosen to be and each thing has its place. He's not sending the, the, the damned away. He's giving them what they want. Though we'll go into that a little bit more shortly in our really fun, uplifting section on hell. But, <laughs> but at the end, there will be the resurrection of the dead. Basically, think of it this way. The final judgment is God finally... You know, when he came and died for us and became incarnate and died for us, he didn't take away the death or the suffering. We still experience that. He wants to use those as means to grow towards everlasting life. But like we talked about in the beginning, before original sin, there was no death or suffering, no pain, no tears, no, no anxiety, none of that. The final judgment's a cool thing because it's when all the bad things become undone. It's when there is a definitive end. You know, John, St. John in the book of Revelation talks about how God will cast death, death and sin into the fiery lake. Like he's going to forever remove, undo, get rid of, not just moral evil, but even those natural evils of death 
life and suffering and pain and illness, they'll be gone. He will judge them. The final judgment's cool. The king returns and fulfills all justice. All wrongs will be made right. All broken things will be made whole. All promises will be fulfilled forever. The final judgment is not a bad thing. We think about the end of the world. That's scary, is it? It's kind of exciting. How many of us have been driving? That reckless guy cutting in and out of traffic? No cop to be seen. You miss once turning on your blinker. $400 fine. Where was the cop then, huh? Don't worry, final, final judgment. <laughs> Justice is coming. So, <laughs> um, so final judgment, it'll show forth both God's justice, God's justice over all injustices that creatures have committed. All nations will be gathered before him. The final judgment will show forth the truth of each person's life and relationship with God. Nothing will be hidden. That's the idea, is that it's a recognition of what we are, what we have become. The damned will be recognized as that because they have become that. The blessed will be recognized as the blessed because they have become that. Yes, with God's grace, but by their choice, because God will never force his grace on them. God knows the hour of his coming. We don't. This calls us to, be, to conversion, to be vigilant at all times. St. Paul tells us now is the hour. Now is the acceptable day. Don't put off conversion till later. If there's something you feel in your life that you have not given over to God yet, don't put it off. Because just because, you know, we don't know when the end of the world is going to be. It could legitimately be 5,000 years from now or in the next 15 seconds. You don't know. I don't know. We always have to be prepared. One of the things, I'm going to pause here for one second to break that open a little bit more. Particularly um, nowadays, we run into this. As I said in my homily this past weekend, people say, well, look what the Bible says, that the, the sign of the end times is there's going to be war and famine, and there's going to be uh, you know, uprisings, and there's going to be earthquakes, and there's going to be... Please point out to me in the history book where those things have never occurred. <laughs> Ever since the original sin, yeah, it's, it's been a ride, I'll tell you. We really had to do a bang-up job of making things terrible sometimes as humans, and there have been terrible disasters. Basically, like I said in my homily, when he comes back, it'll be business as usual. That's why he says, you don't know when. The signs of my coming back are basically everything looks like it's business as usual. That's the thing. We don't know when. Moreover, for each and every one of us, you know, my father is, you know, he's a good Catholic, but he never really, you know, we never got a degree in theology or anything. And it's so fun. It's so cool to be humbled by my dad. Because sometimes I'll just throw out these little gems. I'm like, that's really wise. Where'd you get that from? That's great. He does that to me sometimes. And I'm like, all right, I love being schooled by dad. It's cool. <laughs> but he said, you know, the end of the world, I mean, it's the end of the world for everybody when they die. Well, it's true. That is the end of the world for you. It's not the, e the end of the world, but it is the end of your world in a sense. And we don't know when that's going to be. To always be prepared for death knowing that the judgment follows. And it's not a matter of being super anxious, like, I could die any minute. Well, it's true. But <laughs> it's not that you should be super anxious. You should just be prepared. If you're prepared, there's really nothing to be worried about. And in fact, if we realize that this existence that we have, you know, it's a sinking ship. We're on the Titanic. In I mean, we are, we're on the cosmic Titanic, and we have already hit the iceberg a long time ago. We're still just going down. The fact is, this world will dissolve away anyway. All things will come to an end anyway. The idea is, are our hearts set on heaven? And if they are, well, even if we should die before the end of the world, what's the difference, you know? 
So those are the two judgments. Now, the fun part, hell, I think you know who that guy is. I hope. Yeah, no, he's not good. You see that guy, you run, all right? That's the devil. So this is from Dante's Inferno. I really, really love the imagery that Dante uses in his uh, thing. I wanted to do hell first because I thought it'd be kind of a bummer to end on hell. <laughs> so it's like, you know, eternal fire. Well, good night. <laughs> and it's like decided, oh. so we'll do this one first, huh? All right, hell. Well, I'll come back to that picture then. What is hell? It is the definitive self-exclusion. Notice that, self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed, reserved for those who die in the state of unrepentant mortal sin. So for example, I'm gonna, I committed terrible sins, but I really want to go to confession. Now I'm going to walk to church to go to confession. Boom, hit by a bus. God's going to be like, too bad for you. You didn't get the confession, right? Wrong. He's going to recognize your attempt to try. You know, <laughs> he's not like shrewd. You know, uh, is it better for you to have been absolved? Absolutely. But is it like he's going to recognize that your attempt? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's so unrepentant. So think more of that dude. Doesn't want it. Doesn't care. Looking away from priest, from the angels. Looking away. Not refusing it to the very end. That's what we're talking about. The chief punishment of hell is that eternal separation from God. And there are other secondary punishments as well. Uh, you know, the children of Fatima were given glimpses of hell. So it was like St. Faustina. And uh, the idea was that she might help them to uh, pray for poor sinners. By poor sinners, she meant those souls that are in mortal sin, that they might come to conversion, come back to God. So hell is a choice against being with God forever. And it sounds, it sounds so difficult to think, who would ever choose that? Who would ever choose that? It doesn't sound like that could ever happen. But the fact is, it does happen. One thing to point out, I forgot to put in here, I wanted to, reserved for those who die in a state of unrepentant mortal sin. Yes, yes, but do you remember the gospel account of the, the, um, oh, well, the final judgment with when our, your Lord uses the image of the sheep and the goats, right? Whatever you did do for me, you did for, or what, excuse me, whatever you did for others, you did for me. And to the, those condemned, what you did not do for others, you did not do for me. Very interesting little part hidden in there. I think sometimes we get so wearied out by that text because it goes over like, Lord, when did we do this, 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 this? Well, you did this and this and this and this and this and this. And therefore, and then it's like, Lord, when didn't we do this, this, this? Well, you didn't do this, this, this. Like, oh, saying the same things over and over and over again. It's hidden in there. So you might get, you know, you have to be careful. He says to the blessed, come receive the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What does he say to the condemned? Depart into the everlasting flames prepared for the devil and his minions. Not for human beings. Heaven was prepared for us. Hell was not. It's an unnatural state for us to ever be in hell, but it is possible. God does not want anyone there. Once again, he will not force anyone to not go there either. He, I mean, he'll go all the way. He'll pour himself out to avoid it. He'll even become incarnate and die on a cross. But he'll never force anyone to love him turn back to him. Why does it exist? So God does not desire anyone in hell. He desires that all be saved, but he won't override our free will. We must freely choose his divine love, which means by necessity we can also freely reject it. See, love <coughs> is not just an emotion. Love is a choice. 
The classical definition of love is to, is scholastic theology, is to will the good for the other. Willing the good for the other. It's entirely focused outside. Focused out towards the other. That is a free choice we make. And all of us try to love God by putting him first. We try to love God by putting his interests, his will first. And yet none of us seem to do this perfectly. That's why conversion is not just a one moment thing, it's a lifelong process. We are called to conversion each and every day in the sense that we're called to divest more of our own pride every day, be divested of it, pour out ourselves a little bit more towards God each and every day. And that is perfected for us in heaven. You can get pretty close here on earth, but that's also what purgatory is for. We'll get there then. Um, but God's love, either receiving his love or loving him, it's our choice. The devil can't make us do anything. God can't make us do anything. The battle comes down to us and our will. What will we will? Whose will will we will? Ours or God's? Um, what's my next slide? I want to see what I... We'll come back to that in a minute. So I want to finish on this part. <laughs> Hell is a possibility. It's the self-isolation. So in the Middle Ages, one of the um, descriptions for hell would be curvati and se, literally meaning turned in on oneself. Okay? The idea is that it's a fundamentally it all comes back down to pride. Pride is the mother and root of all sin. It all boils back down to that. The, the sin of Satan was pride. When we say pride, we don't mean like, you know, I built a shed. I feel pretty good about myself. You should. I can't even put a shoe rack together, you know? But when I do and it's crooked, it's like, hey, but it works. I feel pretty good about myself. That's not the pride we mean. That's fine. That's just like, you did a good job. Good for you. We mean by pride in the sense of sin, of the seven deadly sins, pride, the capital sin, huh? We mean such a rejection of God and all reality that we, I mean, we, we turn away from all things so profoundly that we make ourselves our own universe. We are consumed in ourselves. And that's agonizing. For a heart that's made for the infinite God to be consumed and locked in on yourself is torture. It's torture. And all other sins, you know, anger, lust, avarice, Wrath, sloth, Acadia, all these other sins are connected to pride. Pride is a very dangerous sin. That was the sin of Lucifer. He refused to submit to God's will. When asked, will he follow God's will, tradition says his response is, non serveam, I will not serve. When God revealed Tradition is, is that God revealed to these to the angels he intended to not only create man, but to unite himself to them so that they might share in his divine life. Thus being even higher than the angels. Basically he's saying, hey, you know angels, you guys? We know that you're smarter and lighter. You're, you're higher than these human beings. I want you to serve a creature that's lesser than you with the end result that of your work being that they're now higher than you in heaven. It's a pretty humbling thing. We should really thank our angels more often. Our guardian angels, you know. Seeing this plan, Lucifer says, no. No. Who are you to tell me to serve that? I'm better than that. I'm higher than that. When you seek to defy God, you try, you sense in essence you are trying to make yourself God. You say, I don't need to follow your will. Mine is as equal as yours. Thus, the tradition of Lucifer tries to be God. Hence, Michael, right? Say Michael, his battle cry, his name in Hebrew. Who is as God? 
Who dares say that they are equal to God? He's the great humbler of Lucifer, casting him out of heaven. Of course, Lucifer casts himself out in all reality. Um, now, if the devil knows that he's lost the war and he really wants to do something, he knows he can't defeat God. Because remember, all this whole salvation stuff happens, has an eternal aspect to it, so don't, don't worry about time. It gets confusing. Time is a, it's, it's a confusing thing when we get involved in spiritual stuff. So at any rate, he knows I can't defeat God. Well, what would other any good tyrant do if he knows that he can't get his target? How else can he go about it? Turn to the weakest person. Attack those they love. That's how I'll get you. Well, if he can't hurt God, then he'll try to hurt us. He hates us because he hates God. And he hates us who are made in God's image. We're the ones he didn't want to serve. So of course he's going to try to lead us astray. That's the sin of Adam and Eve. They fell into the same sin of Lucifer, pride. Because they defied God's will. He tempted them into it. He replicated himself, in a sense, with, the, with our first parents, getting them to commit the same sin he did with all the false promises that you will be as gods. You don't need God. You can take care of yourself. You don't need him to protect you. You can be your own God. And they grasped at that. That's the meaning behind the, the, the story. And it's that wound of pride, that original sin of pride. Think, why are we going into all this right now? This plays a huge role to make something, helps us soften a blow a little bit later. Um, it explains why that original sin that we're freed of in baptism, something remains. I was teaching the kids today, I kind of use a similar image. I said, it's like when you get a, a disease of some sort, like, a, you know, uh, chicken pox, right? Or later on in life, if you had chicken pox, you might get shingles. You have all these, it's very, very painful, but you could, what, what could be something that has happens as a result, even if you're healed of it? You might have scars left over, right? Illnesses can leave their marks on us. Think of original sin as a spiritual illness. We're, we're, we're cured of it, in a sense. Baptism, we're freed of the guilt of original sin, but we're still wounded by it. It's called concupiscence, a weakness that built into us. It's not really part of our nature, but it's a wound in our nature. We're tempted to move back toward that pride. And whatever route it happens to take, you know, various sins we can choose to get us to the same place. That's why it's such a struggle to say, I know I put God first. We're so deceptive. The devil's deceptive, but we deceive ourselves as well. Pride can be so, so, so subtle. Think of, um, there is a, I just finished reading, highly recommend, there's a little thing at the end of this that says what suggested reading, and it's on there, but I actually just read this right before doing all this stuff here tonight because I thought it'd be really interesting. The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Anyone here read that? All right, two people. <laughs> Let's see it. Next talk, you all better have your hand up. <laughs> it's pretty short, guys. It's not, I think you could get online for free, probably, but, um, it's about a bus ride from hell to heaven. And uh, people decide, some people get, on, get in line to get on the bus, some people don't. But those who do, when they get to heaven, they come to realize that for them, heaven is a painful experience. The blades of the grass hurt their feet. And they realize in the sunlight up in heaven that they're like ghosts, they're see-through, and that they're disfigured. And that, you know, as beautiful as the grass and the trees are, it's like a solid surface. The main protagonist through whom we see, through whose eyes we see everything, he says he notices a flower on the ground. He tries to grab it and to tear, to just, to just, to, it looks so soft. He said he saw a rabbit go by and brush it so gently. And he tries to grab it and tear it out of the ground. And he says he's pulling and pulling and tearing his own skin and he just can't get this flower out of the ground. 
He's entered into the world of the real, of the fullness of existence. His sinfulness has caused him to be less real, less human. His being as a human being is decreased because of his sinfulness. He's more akin to a ghost. And throughout his journey, it's like a modern day version of Dante's Divine Comedy. He walks, he runs into these, there are these beings, the souls in heaven. They're so pure and so bright, they're almost terrifying to look at. And they keep, these are souls from heaven who try to meet up with these particular ghosts from hell to try to lead them. They say, if you want to, you can stay but they have to choose it. And almost, I'm not gonna say, don't wanna ruin it. Let's just say though, fair, I think this is fair enough, not everybody chooses to stay. And the reasons are fascinating. The reasons are fascinating. For example, there's one man who's a, um, an artist, and he's a painter, and he is looking at all of the beauty around him, and he wants to paint it. Well, the bright one, the soul, the, the heavenly soul, who was one of his, who he doesn't know, but he was also a painter in life, says to him, you don't have to. It doesn't make sense. You have the real thing here. He goes, no, it's beautiful. The proportions, the colors, the vibrancy. I gotta paint this. He goes, no, no. But it's, you already have it. He wasn't getting it. He says, look, when you were on earth, you had a keen perception where you could see slivers of the beauty of heaven in creation. And you took that and you put it into this medium on canvas. You painted it and showed the world bits of beauty, the beauty from heaven. Well, this is heaven itself. You have it all here. There's nothing to be painted. You don't have to glimpse for it anymore. You're in it. But the problem was that in his life, what happened is that he lost sight of that transcendent beauty that the earth was supposed to point him toward, which is heaven and God. And he became obsessed with the painting itself, with the style, with the skill, the brushes, the canvases, the different art, the, the different techniques. And the bright one is trying to explain to him, hey, 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 come on, come with me, come with me, and I'll show you. He's like, he said, you will, so you say, I'm never going to paint again? That's all he's caught up on. He's in heaven, and he's like oblivious. He's like, he's obsessed about painting. He's like, I'm never going to paint again? The bright one says to him, you will. When you go through the regeneration, you're healed, you're made whole, you're made real, you will paint again. You see, you will reflect God in such a unique way that nobody else up here will. You'll see him. You'll understand him in a unique way that no one else will. And you need to show that to us. This is we show it all to everyone else. So you will paint again, but not yet. First, you have to leave paint and go. You have to leave everything behind. Seek God and God alone first. And then, yes, you actually will get your painting back ironically. Sad to say, he can't let it go. He's damned for his love of painting. Think, If I were to say, without that context, someone's damned for their love of painting, boy, my odds are really bad to get into heaven. That wasn't the point. The point is that painting was evil. He did not have the love of God in his heart because he wouldn't let it in. Another one is about a woman who had a sick child that died young. She came from hell too, and she was speaking to her brother. And her brother says to her, and he says, she says to her brother who's in heaven, she says, I wanna see, I think his name was Michael, I wanna see Michael. Why can't I see Michael? Why did God take Michael from me? Go calm down. Don't you tell me to calm down, I wanna see Michael. You know, I took care of him when he was sick, and God just took him from me. Okay. He says, you will see him again. You'll have him back. He's here. It's up there beyond the ridge. Yeah, you'll see him again. Yeah, you'll have him back. 
But first you have to let go of him. So when you were alive on earth, you tended to him so much that you neglected everybody else. Your husband, your daughter, your family, your friends. And you became so obsessed with him that you didn't even recognize that God was his father. He belonged to you in your mind like he was your possession. She made an idol out of him. The protagonist is saying, I just can't believe this woman is damned for loving her son too much. And the guy who's guiding him says, she's not. She didn't love her son enough because she made him into an idol. She took her own self-love, the pride that she had, and put it upon him in such a way that what she thought in her mind was her caring for her son, which is that she says, a natural and a good thing, the maternal care of a woman for her child is so beautiful but she made it into something corrupt, something twisted. That's what evil is, it twists good things. She couldn't let go of her son, having him the way she wanted him, when she wanted him, how she wanted him. She was so hardened to have it her way and not trusting that God would take care of her son even in a way more than she could. And we know that was the case in the story because he's in heaven. Eternal beatitude and the resurrection. The point C.S. Lewis tries to make with all these things is, see, hell, heaven's going to be easier because you, <laughs> yeah, hell's the one that people get caught up on. That's why I'm spending time on that one. Don't worry. It's like, oh, my gosh, how do we have like 30 more slides? No, we don't. This is just a slow slide. Because <laughs> we got, it's, it's, it's like we're going through a, like a thing of mud. We're kind of trudging through here. But I really want to break this one open because it's, hell is very misunderstood. Um, um, the idea is that those who are in hell are there because they don't let God in. We think, oh, hell is for those who are like Hitler, Stalin. Well, okay, fair point. You know, <laughs> genocide, it's pretty severe. Um, once again, we don't know that anyone's we don't know like any particular people are in hell. We should never hope that. That's awful. Ever. We should never. We should hope all find salvation. But we know that it is a possibility. And, but if somebody is there, it's not, they're not there because God's like, let me, don't think of God's judgment on the person as God making a decision. Like, nah. You know, it's not, that's not how it's. Just, you almost had me, but you lost points for the hat, you know. He's like, ah, I knew I shouldn't have done that. You know. But that's not how it works. He can't let them in because they don't want to be in. They don't want to love God as God is. Imagine if someone came up to you and said, I would love to be in love with you, but you just need to change everything about yourself to fit what I want. <laughs> well, that's not love at all. We want to take people as they are, but do we take God as he is? God wants us to love him freely, not forcefully. God wants us to love him freely. And we take him as he is, not as we want him to be. We take him, his, we follow his will, not as we want it, but as he wants it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not my kingdom, not my will. Interestingly, when your will becomes united to his, the fascinating thing is that it turns out, generally speaking, whatever you think you lose by giving everything over to God, you don't. It turns out we actually want too little. God's will for us is what we want. And that's so much more than we're even able to realize. But if we say, no, I will not go out of my comfort zone, I do not want what you want in the way you want it. I want it the way I want it. That's not a relationship. That's how hell works. No one's sent there. They choose to go. Last part, then we're going to take a quick break, stretch your legs, cry, whatever. Uh. <laughs> okay. Full disclosure to you here, to you listening. Um, this was from another priest of my buddy of mine. I just thought his articulation was superb. Probably should have asked him if I could use it, but he's not going to care. I took it off Facebook. Okay. 
Uh, the guy is brilliant. Like, puts me to shame. He's so smart. Yeah, I'll freely admit. That's one of the things I discovered about myself that's a bad thing. I'm kind of jealous of him. I shouldn't be. So I got to work on that. But uh, I do feel jealous because he's brilliant. Kind of funny, too. So, all right. Uh, how is eternal damnation possible if God is love? It's like a really complex category on Jeopardy, right? <laughs> you know? I'll take that for 100, Alex. Okay, so he, go, he does a very systematic approach. What is love? Willing the good of another for their benefit. A choice to give good things to another without expecting anything in return. Okay, willing the good. Is justice a good? You know, that's that something we would will to someone? Well, it seems absurd to say that justice isn't a good. Justice is defined as giving to each what they are due. You lend me five bucks, in justice, I owe you five bucks. You break my window, in justice, you owe me a new window. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And it's a good thing. It's what keeps balance. So willing the good for the other, including justice. Is mercy a superior good to justice? It would seem that it is. Mercy is a steadfast love. It's love that refuses to break faith and instead chooses love, willing to do the good, chooses. It's a love that chooses to abide with the beloved as much as possible, even in the face of difficulty, pain, even betrayal. So what mercy does is it doesn't override justice. Rather, mercy moderates retribution, and in place of it, it moderates it with forgiveness. And so it elevates the end of justice from paying back what is due to restoring relationship. So mercy and justice work together in such a way that now justice, the fulfillment of justice, is to be understood as the restoration of relationship. Not just, you broke my window, you owe me a new window. Well, there was something that happened between us. It's not just fixing the window, it's also fixing our relationship. That's the key. Justice and mercy go together. But why is some form of penance required for mercy? Well, we can't force another into a relationship, you know? Wouldn't that be almost tantamount to abuse? We see this in human relationships. Here's part of his non-serious self -coming. Someone rejects my love, it would be creepy if I kept buying them gifts and showing up in their life. <laughs> the best I can do, someone rejects my love, is to wish them well, return anything I owe them, and offer my help if they ever ask for it. If therefore divine mercy is rejected, God still loves us and wills the good of justice i.e., that which we are due based upon how we have lived. So some might ask if it would not be more merciful to simply erase those who reject mercy from existence. Wouldn't this be more loving than existing eternally, separated from God, and suffering punishment commensurate with our sins? Nope. It'd be less loving. Because the first good, the primary good that God could ever will for anyone, is being for, uh, for any being, is existence itself. For something to cease to exist completely means that God has ceased to love it. Hell exists because God is love and cannot hate anything that he has made. So why wouldn't a soul be allowed to repent after death so as to avoid eternal damnation? Well, the problem is that the defect lies in them and their obstinacy, as we talked about, not in the perfection of God. They've made themselves irredeemable. So you see... How can God be a loving God and yet people go to hell? Because love respects the wishes of the beloved. If I love someone and they don't want me to love them, well, the right thing for me to do is not to keep showing up, like, change your mind, baby. It's like, <laughs> call the police, classic move. <laughs> it means she likes me. No. So we get the restraining orders out, right? If I love someone and they don't want that relationship, if I truly do still love them, I back off. I give them what's owned to them. Justice is giving to a person what is due them. If living a life of hardened mortal sin is what is due that person, and they don't want the, my, my love, i.e. mercy, if I am God, I can't force it on them. 
my loving them is letting them go to hell because that's their choice. And wiping them out? See, that's the thing. Remember, God is not just a being in the universe like a super, like Thor or something. God does not exist in the universe. The universe exists in God. God is being itself. That's exactly what it means to the burning bush. Yahweh, I am who am. I am being itself. The source of all being. The Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And God says, the first act of love is that let it be. Let these people exist. To create, to let something exist is itself. Willing it into existence is an act of love. For God to choose to unmake someone would mean that he pulls his love back. But if God fails to love even one person, one instance, he's not God. Because that means love is not free. Evidently it can be lost, which means it can be gained, which means it's not real. Which means it's, it's just a matter of bargaining. Somebody really got upset with me one time when I preached uh, somewhere. Um, only one person. So that was too bad, I guess. Uh, I'm, well, no, it's happened plenty of times in other places. But I mean, like, in this one particular instance. Um, and they're fine. That's whatever. You get mad, you get mad. Sorry, we don't see eye to eye on it, but whatever. I'm not going to wish you any ill harm. You know, or keep showing up in your life and giving you gifts. <laughs> Please accept me. No, that's weird. Um, he said, how, I told you, he, nah, whatever, you don't know him. I just can't accept the fact you said God still loves the devil. I said, yes, but he does. You don't understand. Love is a free gift. The devil does not allow it into his heart. Love is not given because it's earned. Say, if I say, oh, I love someone. It's almost the, the, this, this lesser notion of love that people seem to have, like it's earned based on action. It's like, oh, if I love someone, therefore I love them because they've earned my respect based on their actions. That's not how God's love works. It's a free gift. It's superior to all forms of love. God doesn't love you because you did anything or didn't do anything. He loves you because he loves you. His love is its own it's its own it's a, it's its own origin it has it's its own meaning it's its own purpose it's not uh, it's 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 not nothing comes before it nothing causes it it's its own because god is love it's it, it's 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 uh equal to him it's as eternal as he is so if god pulls his love back that's not just saying that god's love that that's an imperfection not only in God's love, but in, therefore in God himself. That's not the true God. Not the God that we've had revealed to us. So in the sense, how do we know he loves the devil? Because he still exists. How do you know he still loves the souls in hell? Because they still exist. If you ever have a particularly bad day, and you're like, how could God ever love me? You exist. If, you're, <laughs> if you can complain, that means you exist, right? The fact you exist, there you go. God's holding you in being. He's choosing you. He's willing you to exist. He doesn't need you. There's nothing you can add to him. The fact you're even here just means he wants you to be here, not for anything he can get from you because he wants you. So even your complaining is a gift, right? Non-existing things can't complain. So, wow, cool, huh? So that's the thing. God's, and the issue is it's not issue of God's love. It's an issue of letting that love in or not. But before we get to this last part, yeah, it's a cool place. Uh, you want to know how much God does love us? He tries to show it to us, not just by dying on the cross. In the church's tradition, um, we have these, what's called, you know, we talked about um, he descended into hell. There are many pictures you can find online, uh, famous classical paintings called the, with a similar theme. Like, you know, you're like, the resurrection of Christ. There's like a thousand famous pictures, paintings, by different artists and what, with that title. Or, you know, the nativity of the Lord. Same thing. Um, it make, makes looking up pictures sometimes difficult if you don't know the artist, because that means you look it up and like, oh, a thousand pictures are called this. 
But another one you can look up is called The Harrowing of Hell. The Harrowing of Hell. And it's an image that shows Christ bursting down the doors of hell, entering into the place of darkness. The idea of his coming to redeem Adam and Eve. Um, there is this tradition that it's an experience of him. Basically, what it means is, fundamentally, he experienced the full measure of the pains of hell, which is isolation from God. Okay, now take this in for a moment. Second person of the Trinity, both human and divine. So in his, human, his divine nature, he's always connected with the Father and the Spirit. But in his human nature, he is free to experience suffering. He experiences the suffering of isolation from God. Which is, and without, uh, it's, a, it's a suffering that is so piercing, I, there's no words to describe it. Both Bishop Fulton Sheen says, in his reflections on the seven last words of our Lord on the cross, he explains that when our Lord's on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That he's tr showing his, he's showing his companionship with those caught up in the sin of pride who have isolated themselves from God. He's chosen to experience the very pain of hell. This is the darkness God descends into to lead us back to himself. I mean, you want to talk about a God of compassion. You want to talk about a romance. Literally descending into the pains of hell to save your soul. Not because you deserve it, but because, I don't know what's going back there, but because he loves you so much. That's why when we say, it's unfair if someone goes to hell. I like to think of Isaiah's, you know, when God, I think it's Isaiah, when God, in the prophets, God's always like rocking everyone. And he's like, you know, and Isaiah, he goes, is it, you know, God's ways are unfair. This is like Israel saying that. He says, is it my ways that are unfair, O Israel? Is it not rather your ways that are unfair? You who commit all these sins, who, you know, skip out just a little bit on all the laws and the rituals, you who just slide by and dishonor my holy name. It's your ways that are unfair. And it's not that God doesn't want us in, with him in heaven. He's so just and he's so merciful. He's like I said, he's literally willing to go into the depths of hell, the experience of it. That's not an unfair God. That's not a God of wrath. That is the most beautiful suffering, pathetic beauty that you could ever imagine. That is a great God. Hell is not proof of God's, ev of God's, of God's, you know, hell is not proof of, 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 of God's lack of care or love. Proof is, lo hell is proof that there are people who don't want to let it in. So before we get to the happy side of things, which is, everything's uphill from here, guys. Seriously, we've descended into this, and now we're going to go back up, and we'll wrap up, and we'll get you all out on time and everything, but how about we just, like, stretch our legs for a few moments and wail and lament for our sins? Okay, so let's make our final part of the journey here upward this time and uh, gather back together and... Take a look quickly here at purgatory, which is really, I think, undervalued very much nowadays, uh, unlike it has been many times in the past. Now, supposing we are not, we do not find ourselves in uh, hell, <laughs> purgatory, a nice alternative. Purgatory, unlike what some people think, is not a 
halfway point between heaven and hell. Some people think, oh, isn't that like a, and some non-Catholics think that we think this, like, oh, it's like where God, you know, it's he- you can either go to heaven or hell, it's like a halfway point, like where you're decided for, no. No, I like to tell people, I think more accurate, it's God's safety net, right? Book of Revelation says that nothing unclean can enter into heaven. Well, that would mean even if I had the smallest venial sin, right? God couldn't mean that. He does. Because that's one part of you not given over to him, one part of you that doesn't want to be with him. All of your heart wants, has to want to be with him. Well, that's why we have this cool place. It's like God's antechamber, his locker room, right? For you, you know, it's, yeah, if you're, you're done on the field, you fought, your, you, you played the game well on earth, clean up, then go home. Think of it that way, all right? Purgatory is, is purg, like purge. There is a bit of suffering in purgatory because being cleansed, you know, can be painful. Like when you put peroxide on a wound, it heals it. But boy, do you feel it, right? It's the same thing. Purgatory is painful, but also a joy. Because it's the idea that says the purification. What, what, what is it? It's the purification that go, that's undergone by those who die in God's grace and friendship. They have sanctifying grace, but are still imperfectly purified at the time of death. Purgatory shows forth both God's justice and mercy. In justice, you, must, you owe him the debt of your love. But every part of your heart, you're not giving to him. But in mercy, he lets you pay it off instead of, you know, gone forever. Once again, though, the souls in purgatory are people who would be willing to be separated from those selfish parts of them. They're not obstinate. They are willing to let God in. So they can be purified of it. The purification is entirely different from that of the damned because it does come to an end. The doctrine of purgatory is based in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. For example, in the second book of Maccabees, where after the battle, so we, uh, they they find all the soldiers who had died, and they open up their shirts and they find that they were wearing little idols, meaning that they weren't placing their trust in the God of Israel. So they take up a collection to be sent to the temple in Jerusalem to have a sacrifice offered for the forgiveness of their sins. Old Testament, they're doing this stuff, so. Uh, Also, that one mysterious scripture verse where our Lord talks about, you know, lest you be taken by the jailer and the jailer takes you to, you know, the judge and the judge takes you here and you will be locked away and you will not be released. He says, amen, I say to you, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. That's a reference to purgatory. But notice what he says, you will not be released until, meaning you can be released, meaning purgatory is temporary and it's a good thing, you know. Hell, there is no release. So, like, this is actually, purgatory is a good thing. You know, like I said, there's, there's motivational posters that I always put in schools. Like, I remember, like, and I, some of you probably already heard me say this, but just, you know, pretend I did it and laugh anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, the whole, it's like, aim high, you know, aim for the moon. If you miss, at least you'll land among the stars. Like, oh, okay, great. And it's really mushy. Like, like, I'm glad you feel good about yourself, kid, but you still feel the PSAT. So, no, you know. <laughs> so here's the thing. Aim for heaven. If you miss, at least you'll land in purgatory. That's the way I like to say it. Because <laughs> guess what? It's a guarantee you're getting to heaven. Even if now they say, like, how long will you be in purgatory? Purgatory exists outside of time. It's kind of hard to say what time would be like. In pur- Listen, if it were equal to, like, a million years of being purged and cleansed, which is probably uncomfortable, I'll take it. If I know I'm definitely getting to heaven, you know, Some of our Protestant brothers and sisters say, well, I know I'm going to heaven. Well, that's great. I wish I had that assurance. What's cool, souls of purgatory can say that. That's what's awesome about them. You know, yeah, we should pray for them. So don't be like, why do I have to pray for them? They're going to heaven. Don't be jealous. Help them get to heaven because then they can pray for you because you're going to need it too. Uh, We can help them by our prayers, and they can help us by their prayers in general. We don't pray to particular souls of purgatory. We ask the souls of purgatory pray you know, ask them for their intercession. But they can't pray for themselves. Their time of doing penance was given them on earth. If they died without anything being repented of, any part of themselves not being given over to God, there was no sense of contrition or turning back to him. They can't make up for that on their own now. Just being, it's like their time out is itself the punishment that purges them as they draw closer to, to heaven. 
Evan. Dante's uh, Divine Comedy again. This is actually pretty hard to find. Evidently, there are a lot of really detailed, interesting pictures of hell, a little bit less of purgatory, and heaven is just like pictures of clouds. It's like, well, I hope it's more than that. I could see that, on, I could, I could see that from a 747, <laughs> you know? It's hard to find like pictures representing the glory of heaven. Um, but I think maybe that might teach us a lesson. Kind of hard to imagine what would heaven be like, you know? Heaven is per perfect life with the Holy Trinity, a communion of life and love with the Trinity, the Virgin Mary, the angels, and all the blessed. Supreme and unending happiness, not just a pure emotional happiness, but like the, I mean, I mean, so much more, unimaginably more than that, a pure joy. Greatest, the greatest joy of heaven will be the beatific vision, that is seeing God face to face. Here's what's so cool about that. God the Father, <laughs> if you listen to our gospel this morning at Mass, God the Father is unknown and unknowable. That's why Jesus says, no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. It is through Jesus Christ we come to know the Father. The eternal mystery, the ancient mystery, that is God himself, we come to encounter. Every spark of beauty, truth, goodness that we see, that we touch for the briefest moments in this life, that's the fulfillment of it all. You know? There will be a lot of secondary, kinds of secondary, but still great, wonderful joys in heavens, joys and pleasures. And the great end, the greatest joys of heaven do not rule out the lesser, but still wonderful. How to get to heaven? Okay, dying in a state of grace, i.e., in, in a state of sanctifying grace. Those will be, they will be for, with God forever in heaven, either immediately or after purification and purgatory. Uh, one must be perfectly purified to enter into the beatific vision. Okay, you say that. Heaven has been closed to us by sin, but by his death and resurrection, Christ has opened the gates of heaven to us. God wants us all to make it to heaven, but will force no one. The new heavens and the new earth. This is exactly what it's going to look like. I have a picture from the future. No. <laughs> uh, the fact is, mm, thirsty. There will be, at the end of all things, a new creation. This world, you know, will go away. The, it's, the, the ancient image, St. Peter uses this in his letter. He says about how God will, all things will be destroyed with fire. Like the world, all, thi all of creation will somehow burn away and then be made new. I don't think he literally means it, but it's an image of the idea that all things will eventually fall. It will, it, there'll be a decay. There will be an end to all that exists in the material universe, but God will remake it as it was in the beginning right but more but per, per, per perfected no possibility of sin ever coming back again and there will be everlasting happiness peace and communion with god and all those in heaven the universe will be transformed god will be all in all this is a little fun section the glorified body everyone will have a resurrected body we say in the nicene creed every week i look forward to the resurrection of the body but only those in heaven will have glorified bodies. The resurrected bodies of every human being in hell will also conform to the states of their souls. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting thing. I don't think we realize. Everyone's getting a resurrection. Everyone. So that means for those in heaven, what they experience with their glorified risen body, the joys of heaven won't be just spiritual. They'll be almost in a sense almost tangible too. Well, there's an opposite side to that. <laughs> So you know all those medieval paintings where they have like devils like prodding people? Like that's a ridiculous. I don't know. <laughs> uh, if you're in hell, evidently you get a body back, which is kind of bad news bears because that makes your suffering so much worse. Maybe there's going to be something like prodding. I don't know. But um, yeah, well, that's why we want to avoid it, right? But the resurrected bodies of every human being. But those who are resurrected in heaven, the glorified body. What's cool about this is that 
how do we know, what do we know about the glorified body? The following information is kind of put together both from what we read in scripture about Jesus Christ and his risen body, because we notice after he rose from the dead, his body was a real body, right? He ate fish, he walked, he talked, Thomas touched him in the sign, but it wasn't quite the same. St. Thomas Aquinas will use scripture and other aspects of philosophy and theology to, this is a lot of things just kind of brought together here, okay? Aspects of the glorified body. Identity. The glorified body will be that of the same person before they died. See? No reincarnation. You don't become a butterfly. You don't become an angel. You're you. Better get to know yourself and like yourself. You'll be with you forever. <laughs> but you don't have to do it, you know, isolated and out. You can do it in a cool place and actually enjoy yourself. We will keep our original identity. However, our risen bodies won't look the same as they did in this life. Because remember, they said Mary Magdalene didn't recognize the Lord. And yet, in a sense, we wouldn't say that he was, like, completely different. Like, you know, he was clean-shaven and bald. Like, no, 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 no. He looked, and then he was only five feet tall. No, he didn't change like that. It was almost like you could imagine, wait, it is you. How could I have not seen it before? I see it now, but initially I didn't. There is a difference, but we are the same people. Integrity. The glorified bodies, will, glorified bodies will have all their parts, regardless of how they died. Our bodies will be complete. There will be no bodily defects or disabilities in our glorified bodies. A young man asked me in class today, how can God, like if he comes back in 2,000 years and everyone's risen from the dead, I mean, there won't be anything of me left. So it'll be dust. Like, yeah, but I mean, how can God put that together? Like, okay, hold on. You know how he made everything, right? What did God make everything from? Nothing. He could put some dust back together. He's God. You know, geez, have some faith, kid. No. It's... <laughs> so quality. Uh, the glorified body will appear as in the prime of life, only better, and will, of course, retain the gender God gave it from the moment that it was conceived. You're you. Get used to you. Jeez. Like when Jesus rose from the dead, he's still a man, you know? Agility. The glorified body will be able to be wherever it wants to be, when it wants to be there. So that's why it's just like apostles locked in the upper room, and all of a sudden, hey, I'm, hey guys. And Jesus just shows up, like, ah. And then he's just like, hey, what's that? Boom, he's gone. You know, he can just do that. The physical body is physical. It's a real material body, but it's not bound by the limitations of the material universe anymore because it's glorified. It's raised higher than it was before. Human body 2.0, okay? Put it that way. Subtly, matter will not act as a hindrance to the glorified body. The glorified body will be able to pass through objects. This is a real body, not merely the appearance of a body, not a ghost, but a real body. Impassibility. Remember that thing that we lost from original sin? The, ability to, the inability to suffer? We get that back. The more, no more pain, suffering, no corruption or decaying or wearing out of the body. Every tear will be wiped away. Finally, clarity and brilliance, clarity slash brilliance. Every glorified body will be beautiful beyond our imagining. No matter how that body may have looked while in this world, they will be magnificently brilliant, stunningly so. They'll be the perfection of what God's creation is. And there will be no pride on our part to fall in love with ourselves because our own perfection shows forth God's brilliance just as masterworks of art show forth the brilliance of the artist. You know? Helps to holiness and heaven. Faith in Christ and baptism. Really good start. Holy Mass every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation. It's this weekend, by the way. So. <laughs> and frequent reception of the most blessed sacrament. Nota bene. We must be in a state of sanctifying grace to receive Holy Communion. Okay. Back to it. Frequent reception of the sacrament of confession. Obedience to the church, like the teachings, the faith doctrine. True devotion to Mary, the mother of God, the holy angels, and all the saints. You got literally all of heaven's like rooting for you. Let them help you, you know? Daily prayer, the rosary, value of sacramentals, you know, holy metals, holy water. Formation of the truth. Yeah, there you are, you're doing that. Good work, see? Make a practice already. Practice of the virtues, doing good and avoiding evil. Keeping the commandments, penance and almsgiving, commitment to the poor and vulnerable, special way to the unborn. Suggested reading. I'm going to leave that up there. Do I have anything after that? I don't think so. There you go. So, in a nutshell, there's eternity. And, yeah. There
I know we reached 8 o'clock, but if anybody would uh, like to ask any questions, I'm certainly willing to take any. Yes. Mm -hmm. It can be. It can be. Because suffering can be used for good or it can be wasted. You see, purgatory, <coughs> in a sense, when we talk about purgatory, we talk about that what's called temporal punishment due to sin. Temporal punishment due to sin, here's the long and short of it. I'm playing baseball, right? And I hit a home run. And then I break the neighbor's window. Crash. I go, back to, I go over to the neighbor. I admit what I did wrong. So I confess it. I uh, ask for his forgiveness. I show contrition. If he's a good neighbor, he accepts that forgiveness. Now we're reconciled. Relationship's fixed. Window's still broken. I still owe it to him to fix that window. That's why we do penance, to make up for the damage that we've caused. So that's part of it with pur purgatory, right? Making up for that. The sufferings we endure on earth can be used to atone for our sins. It's about our intentionality. I offer, you know, to unite our sufferings to our Lord. Because our sufferings in and of themselves do nothing for us. That's why Pope Pius XII, I believe it was, says that we should unite our sufferings with the suffering of Jesus Christ. It becomes incorporated into his and just as his suffering merits you know, salvation, ours, we, if we give it over to him, it gets kind of absorbed into his and can help to atone for sin as well, ours and others. We become part of his work to redeem the world. This is what St. Paul means when he says, I make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. He's not saying that Christ's sacrifice wasn't like good enough. He's saying that he needs to be incorporated into it. So our sufferings can be part of our purification, even now, if we choose to use them that way. Some people complain, and, you know, I mean, I've complained too. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but it's a good lesson. Our sufferings can be really powerful to help us spiritually and others and the souls in purgatory. Um, but just suffering in and of itself is not purgatory because you think the souls in hell are suffering, and yet that suffering will not end. As our Lord says in the Gospel of Matthew, where the worm dieth not and the flame is not quenched, suffering in and of itself can be an incredible help towards you know, going through purgatory, shortening the time ahead of time. Or it can become a means by where we get caught up in ourselves by using our suffering as an excuse to turn back in on ourselves. That's why looking to the cross is so important. This is why the crucifix is so, so, so important. Not just to tell us how much God loves us, but to lead us into how we are called to imitate him. And not just imitate, but unite that suffering with his in such a beautiful way that Christ's sacrifice lives in and through us to touch our souls and those of others. It's a great question, though, because suffering, there's a lot of value there. It's a, it's, there's a lot there. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, the authority I'm going to rely on uh, for that answering that question are all the exorcists I've talked to. If you want to try, if you, if you want knowledge about what's going on at the ground level, you don't ask the general. You ask the guy in the trenches. He knows what's up, right? He's living it. All of them have said to me, and, the, and there's a lot of and there are books on this. Actually, there's a book in Tam Publishing about purgatory that talks about this. Souls in purgatory who, by God's permission, are allowed to appear to ask, in a sense, ask for prayers. But there's also a few signs, lest we, lest we slip into a talk about other things here, because uh, it's a good question, but I, I don't want to branch off too far. Souls in purgatory, if they really are souls from purgatory, we have to be very careful, because the demonic likes to imitate the deceased, the recently deceased even, to try to lead us astray, uh, because that's all they do. They're tricksters, they're liars. That's, ugh, it's, and it's horrible that they do that. 
generally, if it's a soul in purgatory, one, they're allowed to be there because of God's permission. They're not just going rogue, you know. Two, they generally won't communicate, you know, other than, you, it, it, other than making clear the fact of, I need help, <laughs> you know, pray for my soul. So they won't try to, like, establish communication or anything like that. Um, and generally speaking, there's differences that there's no sense of dread. Like, I mean, fear. Yeah, something appears at the foot of my bed. Pfft, those sheets are ruined, right? <laughs> but there's a difference between that and utter dread, which you would encounter with a demonic, which is a fear that's not just being scared. It's a fear that's palpable. It's a darkness that's palpable. It's an entirely different, it's an entirely different form of fear when it comes to the demonic. Um, but when it's a soul, it, yeah, you're like, oh, geez. But it's at the same time, it's not quite the same aspect of sheer horror. So there is some merit to it. There is, uh, you know, there's um, many, many, many uh, you know, supposedly souls of purgatory visited many different saints. There's a convent in Italy where they have a burn mark, like of a hand, right up on the top of the door frame where a soul, this nun who had visions of the souls in purgatory and woke up from it, Saw the hand marks is still burned on there. The idea is that it's trying to communicate, hey, we're in purgatory, kind of need your help. Once again, they will not try to communicate with you, like try to have a conversation or talk about stuff. That's, if that happens to you, don't talk to it. That's not, okay. But yeah, so there is merit to it. Just like souls from heaven can appear. That's why people have visions of the saints sometimes, right? Or angels. It's rare, it's not as common you know, as I think we might think it is, but yeah. So there is some merit to it, there really is. Yes. If you have to go, please go, I don't want to keep anyone hostage. Yes. I mean, yeah, you're, you're getting along the lines of it. Creation is not evil or by any, by any standard. The problem is that creation is wounded. The problem is that creation is a fallen creation. Like, yes, yeah, storms are natural, right? But are tsunamis that wipe out entire islands of people natural? I mean, that just seems like it's a little too much. The idea is that there's like diseases that can wipe out entire continents of people. There's parts of nature that are just too broken to be just that, it's not like that on its own. That's part of the woundedness from original sin. It kind of falls back on us. So, the issue then is that, yes, creation is not evil whatsoever. The world, as it's meant by St. John, is what he means, and that, in, in which includes what you've talked about, but it's more than that too. It's an entire mindset of a secularist approach, um, like Tower of Babel. We don't need God, we'll be, we'll be our own God, and we will conquer all things on our own and we will live by our own commands. It's like the Church of Satan. They're, um, they're the, like the actual, you know, trademark Church of Satan people. Their, uh, their, their thing is, you know, uh, do, you know, basically to, to um, I don't actually have the actual term, I don't have the actual phrase on, my, on top of my head, but, uh, but essentially basically to, you know, as long as you don't harm anybody, but do whatever you want, you know? And the idea is that um, that's not good. Because first of all, some people will allow themselves to be harmed if they want that. Um, secondly, it's living, it's, it's a defiance of all sense of a God's authority. It's a worldly way of thinking. Um, so even like we talk about worldliness, well, what's a worldly value? Um, being number one, being the most beautiful, the richest, the smartest, the most admired, having the most stuff, these are worldly things. So we don't mean world as literally globe. No, the globe's not evil. People on the, on the globe can act evil. Um, but yeah. I think we might be able to put this up on yeah website. So yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes.
oh, oh, no, 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 not, you can't pray for, you can't ask, you shouldn't be asking for a particular soul to pray for you. You should ask for, once again, because it's kind of tied into what we were talking about back over here. Communication with the dead can be a very dangerous thing. So, like, we say, I'm going to ask all the souls, you know, souls in purgatory, pray for me that I might, whatever. That's fine. They can pray for you. They can't pray for themselves, like, for their own forgiveness. Right now, I can say, Lord, have mercy on me. They can't. They've made their decision up to a point. Like, they're, now this is their working out of what's left over. Yeah, what I, so the avoidance is to avoid trying to talk to one person. Yeah, and they don't know who it is. Correct, yeah. correct. And also, by the way, yeah, if you're praying for a soul in purgatory, and that soul is actually, you know, since they, you know, they, they made bail, you sprung them out. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can't believe I wasted all these years praying for you. You've already been out. No, it, it's not like it gets wasted. God's going to probably help someone else. Like, I've been paying your bills all this year, and you moved? You know? Jeez. No, it helps someone else out. The new occupant gets the help. Yeah. Correct. Uh-huh. Well, <coughs> sure. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, no, sure. Sure. You know, I would say, you know, when it comes to that, that because we don't know where people are, right? Like, I still pray every single night for my my grandparents, family, friends, um, those who have gone before, because I don't know if they're there or not, you know. Yeah, you do that in mass. yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, the mass is offered for the living and the dead, right? right? And that's why we have mass intentions, in fact. That's exactly what it's for. Um, but the idea that, like, we're going to pray, we, we can ask prayers for a particular person in purgatory, or ask somebody, and think about a soul in heaven that's a blessed, like God, uh, that's a saint, right? We know who we're talking to. The thing is, when it comes to that, they're in such complete union with Christ. And what connects us and the souls in heaven is the Holy Spirit. Think of it like Facebook, right? All of us are connected. Like, oh, we all, we all have the program. We all have the computer. But what actually gives us the power to connect? The Internet. Make That's the Holy Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit, we are united to the saints to be able to pray to them, talk to them one-on-one -on -one in such a way that it's not a matter of danger. It's not a matter of... Even idolatry, you know, as we're claimed sometimes, you are worshiping saints. Just talking to Francis. Or t just talking to Anthony. Lost those car keys again, you know. <laughs> and it, it's like, oh, they were in my hand the whole time. <laughs> Got it. You know. Um, may or may not have done that before. Twice. Anyway. But when it comes to our loved ones, it's one of those things where we want to keep praying for them. And, I mean, the idea is, you say, like, you know, I pray for my loved ones, and Lord, if I would say, like, even then, Lord, if they can pray for me, I ask them to pray for me. It's one of those things we want to keep that connection with them grounded in our relationship with the Lord. See what I mean? Yeah. Because it's the Lord who unites yeah, us together. Somebody else can get in and, and take that's part of the issue. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. There's so much good, and the demons are so annoying, and they're getting worse, too. So pray your St. Michael prayer. Help us out, all right? It's getting worse. That's the problem. That's the problem. It's not like, oh, so if I want to talk to my beloved, my, my, my loved one, then that's a, that's a bad thing. No, it's not that that's, it's, there are a lot of people, there you go, I love that. Yeah, someone can hack in, and they do it a lot, because they're jerks for eternity. <laughs> Until that final judgment, when they go down with that guy who cut me off on the road, right? <laughs> no, I don't know, I hope, I hope he makes it. Yes. Yes, and also when we, St. Thomas Aquinas would say when we receive Holy Communion, mm -hmm. venial, sin, venial sins are absolved. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, so that's why staying close to the sacraments are, I mean, yeah, that's pretty, see, you know, the, the closer you stand in the light, the less the darkness can be present. The closer you are to the warmth, the further away the cold is. The closer you are to God, the more evil stays away. Who goes straight? Well, evidently Mary. <laughs> um, but I guess here's the thing. What could be a possibility? Once again, because we can't, it's like we don't have our authority to say, I know that this person went straight to heaven. Odds, though. So can, but can people go straight to heaven? I would say yes. I would say yes. Um, one, pr one, one prime example, during giving the, the, you know, the last rites, okay? So the anointing of the sick. So if somebody's actually going through, like they want, they need the anointing of the sick, it comes with absolution of sins, which means if they're conscious, they should actually ask the priest to hear their confession first. You know what I mean? They should actually hear, so, because that's appropriate, that, that'd be the, that's like what last rites means. It, rites, R-I-T-E-S, plural. It's not the last anointing. It's all three, it's a trifecta of confession, anointing, and Holy Viaticum, which in Holy Viaticum, it's not just receiving communion the last time makes it automatically Viaticum. There's actually a rite of Viaticum. It's pretty cool. Um, that's what last rites is as a total. If somebody receives absolution from confession, so absolution's taken care of, but you say, okay, what about that temporal punishment due to sin, the stuff we have to work out, like in purgatory that might be left over if we were to die right then and there? Um, at the moment of death, the priest is also allowed to administer something called the apostolic pardon, okay? So at the moment of death, the priest is given permission to give the specific prayer, which is a, is this, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the prayer off the top of my head. That's why I have it in the book, because I never want, I don't want to mess it up. I keep it right there bookmarked. But something about, like, by the authority given to me by the Holy See, and something that apostles, holy apostles, in the intercession of the holy apostles, Peter and Paul, I grant you a full remission of uh, full remission and something of all your sins, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which is just like, poof, all debts paid. Did you get that? No, no. <laughs> that was a demonstration. <laughs> no cheating, no jumping in line. I don't think the counts if I, if I inserted the word something, something a couple times. <laughs> But, yeah, so, like, I would say, like, then somebody right there died, unless they decided to commit a mortal sin in half a second. I mean, now, I'd say their odds of going straight to heaven at that point, pretty good. You know, but once again, that's why it's so close to stay close to the sacraments. So it's not one of those things where it's just like, oh, I found myself in a situation where I haven't even thought about calling a priest. We should, you know, that's why we're on call. Somebody call me. Over here. No, I can't. You're not actively dying. I only have the authority when you're actively dying. Otherwise, it won't count. I can't just do it. I can't go rogue. That's what the devil did. I don't want to do that. One second. One second. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So that's the thing. So let's say somebody is unconscious, right? That's another good time to use anointing of the sick, where it's like, I don't know if that person is contrite for their sins, but it is my duty to offer this to them in the case that they are, right? So I do that. Now, could it be, just like confession, sac absolution wouldn't be valid if the person actually wasn't sorry, even if they said they were, but really they weren't. It's not magic. It's not like, oh, I said the right words and waved my hand, therefore you're forgiven. No, your intention matters for it to work. If you're not actually sorry, it doesn't take effect. Same thing with anointing of the sick, apostolic pardon. I just like to, I'm just like, I really hope you want to be forgiven. <laughs> you know, I don't say that. I actually say the real words. But I'm thinking that. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. You know. 
Yeah, no, that's a very val. Yeah, because once again, it's not just Matt. It's not like, you know. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Do you know Oh, yeah. I'm wondering, what's going to happen to these people? If we're straight up like they think? Oh, yeah, no, no. Just because you think it's going to happen doesn't make it's going to happen. Right. Like, <laughs> it's like, I know for a fact that I'm going to get a check for a million dollars tomorrow. I don't care how many good vibes I get about it. <laughs> I'm still going to make less than... I just hope they get into the suit. Oh, it was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, me too. Are you kidding me? I hope I get there too. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, like... No, that's the thing. I don't want anyone to canonize me when I die. Like, well, he's with God now. I hope if I'm in purgatory, you better be praying for me. Don't just assume I'm in heaven. Help me out, man. Pray for my soul. You know, don't just say, I know he's with God. I hope. Help me out. Help me help you, right? You know, it's, it's a team effort. That's why we call it the church. The church is more than just us here on earth. We're called the church militant. Because we're fighting for our salvation, spiritual warfare. Like St. Paul, I fought the good fight. I have run the race. The sword of faith, you know, the breastplate of justice and all the other. Yeah, okay, great. Um, there's the church suffering, those who are in purgatory. And then there are the church triumphant, those who are already in heaven. We all got to work together. So, like, I always pray for the deceased. Even if it's someone like I know that they just, I just anointed them, gave them all the things, and right? That's cool. I'm still going to pray for them. Because... What if there was still something a little bit hanging on? I want to help them get to heaven. That's the cool thing about the modern day. When people are, have no faith and they think that death, earthly death is the end of life, what do doctors say at many times? There's nothing more we can do. It's like finally the hubris of the modern world gives way in acknowledging I can't do anymore. What's so cool about the faith, we're not bound by those rules. There is more we can do. Every human heart was made for God, for Jesus Christ, for heaven. And we can help those who have gone before us to fulfill that dream. There is something we can do. As a priest, I can anoint and absolve. As faithful, we can pray for our brothers and sisters. There's so much more we can still do. Even when the world falls short of being able to take care of people, we can do so much more still. That's why praying for the dead is so important. Don't just assume we go straight to heaven. I, I hope... I mean, if I did, that'd be great. Seriously, if I get locked in purgatory, I'm going to rejoice. I'm not going to lie. I'll be like, oh, man. Yeah, I know. It's like I just slid into home. I just made it. Like, they're going to be like, no, nah, let's wait. Let's do it. We're doing a review on this, you know. <laughs> Throw a flag. You're like, no. And they're like, ah, it looks like, you know, come back for commercial break. It looks like he just made it. And then everyone's like, boom. I'm like, yeah. Now, I don't know if that's what it'll be like at all, but whew, man, if I get in there, woo, that'd be what a relief. I don't care if I'm like in the fires of purgatory for a billion years, because it's like I know it's coming to an end. I'm guaranteed heaven. Pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. So. <laughs> you got that right, because it comes to an end and you're growing closer to God, so you're growing in joy and love every day. Pretty cool. Yeah. I'm going to wrap it up here in a minute and we'll give you a blessing. Last one here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry to hear that. Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Yeah. So we pray for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but purgatory is not a punishment per se. It's like, well, I didn't know there was a purgatory, so will I be spared purgatory? It's just like, that's the safety net. You don't want to be spared the safety net just in case you need the safety net. So it's like, even if you didn't believe there's a just like someone who says, there is no hell. And like, eh. All right, I hope you don't find out the hard way. Uh, you know, it's going to be there whether we realize it or not. Um, so, like, there is a purgatory. So can there be Protestants who don't believe in purgatory in purgatory? Sure. And we should pray for them. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, maybe more Catholics because we knew better and we, we didn't really like, yeah. Hey, that's a, that's a danger of having the one true faith. We have more responsibility. So, and the more you're educated and the more you know, the more responsible you are. So, gotcha. Because now I just educated you more. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, well, let me, let me, let me, let me I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to finish up. I'm going to give everyone, I'm going to say a prayer and then I'll grab you afterwards, okay? Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of our salvation wrought through the sacrifice of your Son on the cross. And as we praise, bless, and adore your holy name, we ask that you send your spirit on our hearts, that we might be open to giving ourselves entirely to you, who are goodness, love, and mercy itself. We ask this in all things through the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.